monopoly market form is quite complex and uh, dynamic. And there are diverse models and theories to explain how prices and output are determined under um, oligopoly model. So this is one, uh, or this is the second one in the uh, models of oligopoly, the Bertrand's duopoly model. In the last uh, two uh, presentations, I had explained the Cournot's model and using a reaction curve to explain stable equilibrium of Cournot. Bertrand model, Bertrand's model is uh, uh, from a review of what Bertrand did of Kudo's uh, writing of 1838. This writing of uh, Bertrand in 1883 led to a change in the way we understand um, Kudo's idea about output, which remained in vogue for about 45 years. So this is a review, it is not uh, something uh, written originally in that sense. He has reviewed the work of Kuno and that is what came to be known as the Bertrand model. Being a French mathematician, he was very critical of Kuno's uh, use of mathematics in understanding the behavior of the two firms. And he made this very critical uh, statement that um, uh, Kurno had reached mis misleading conclusion. He also said that Kurno's work needs to be uh, deserved to be neglected because its algebraic uh, arguments were faulty. And uh, um, Kurno did, uh, Bertrand did not believe that mathematics can be used to explain human behavior. He also said that if you remove the uh, symbols that Kurno used in his uh, writing, then the whole writing would be just a couple of pages and not a book. So that's the level of uh, critical uh, thinking that was developing, uh, that is required to develop new ideas and new theories. Now there is this famous uh, Bertrand uh, Kuno debate and this debate is about what can firms do in terms of prices and uh, output. So um, Kuno's argument was that the firms will decide the output and Bertrand's argument was that firms will decide the prices. And when we teach monopoly, we usually explain this, that the firm cannot decide both the price or, and the output, and the firm can decide either of them. So here is the origin for that particular idea that we teach in microeconomics. There are essentially four themes that originate from uh, this Kuno bertrand um, debate. One is, uh, about assumption and the other way is how the two firms manipulate the market to get what they want to achieve. In terms of assumption, the Kuno's model believes that the rival will keep the output constant and in Bertrand's model, the rival will keep the price constant. Now coming to how the two firms will manipulate the uh, situation, uh, in Kuno's model, the firm will manipulate the output whereas in the Bertrand model, the firm will manipulate the prices. So there are two different approaches to hopefully a, a similar problem of how to attain equilibrium under this uh, market form. The assumptions of uh, Bertrand are no different from that of Kurno, and he maintained that two firms, identical products, no transaction cost, and there is no cooperation between the two firms. So each firm believes that uh, rival price uh, will remain constant. And the productive, the other thing he believed was uh, the productive capacity of the firm can be changed to meet the uh, required uh, demand. And both the firms uh, have constant marginal cost and both the firms have profit maximization as its goal. Now let's come to understanding consumer behavior with regards to price. So the question is very simple. If two firms charge the same price, how, how will consumers behave? It is obvious when goods are identical, firms uh, are charging the same price, consumers will move to both the, uh, both the firms, maybe half and half would be the way the consumers would be distributed. Now the question arises when the firm changes its price, one of the firm changes its price, what will happen to that firm and its consumers? Today, it is quite obvious to understand that when, if one of the firms increase the price, the consumers will move away from that firm, from that high priced firm to a low priced firm. And the higher price will have nothing to sell because all the consumers will move away from that high price to the 
low priced firm. So the profit strategy, the way the firms are going to get their profit will depend upon the strategy they use to fix the prices of their uh, firms. Now both the firms are, uh, are independent. Both the firms don't negotiate. This is not collusive oligopoly. And we understand that both of them will make simultaneous moves. And these moves are not based on the uh, on or based on negotiation with the other firm. So each seller determines his price on the assumption of the rival price. That the rival will not change the price, the firm would want to make its change. For and for every uh, chain, price that is ch uh, chain charged by B, there will also be a unique price charged by A, which can maximize A's profit. So that is the thing. So A and B both are interacting uh, in the market, but they are not negotiating each other. So A's firm, uh, A's pricing will bring about change in B's pricing as well. Now, uh, what uh, Bertrand uh, develops the idea uh, that develops the idea is that there will be intense war between the two firms, and this price war is a characteristic of this kind of oligopoly markets which is visible even today. So what will be the price that the firm will choose which will give it the maximum profit and this according to Bertrand will happen by firms undercutting the prices so that they can get more customers or more consumers to their side. So price cutting or price war is the way to increase the consumers and thereby increase the number of the amount of profit that the firm can get. But the price cut will uh, work as long as the price covers the cost of production. Now we come to use a reaction curve. Reaction curve was presented in the last video and I suggest that you can uh, watch that video to understand the, uh, the idea behind a reaction curve. Though it was used for Bertrand, but uh, it used for uh, Puno, but it, the same idea in a different way is applied for Bertrand. So there is a in continuous interplay between the decision of both the firms, and we can explain that using the reaction curves. So there are only two firms A and B, and on the vertical axis we shall use firm uh, B's price, and on the horizontal axis we shall use uh, firm um, A's uh, prices. So on the two axes, firm A and B and their respective prices are shown. So for any uh, price charged by B, there will be a price charged by A which will maximize A's profit. Both the firms are interested in finally making up more profit. Let's see uh, the firm A's uh, reaction curve in more detail and the same can be used to explain firm B's reaction curve. Now firm uh, isoprofit uh, curves here are convex to the origin, unlike the isoprofit curves of uh, um, that of uh, Kurno. So here we see that they are convex to the origin. Let's take this condition at uh, price PB1. So when price PB1 is charged by firm B, then firm A is at price A at profit level A. Now when firm B reduces its price from PB1 to PB2, then uh, firm A is also forced to reduce its price from PA1 to PA2. Ultimately when firm B reaches price uh, P, then that unique price is also attained by firm uh, A where it is at point E and the firm price will be PAE. So PAE and P shows the price at which both the firm seems to have uh, settled in that sense that PE price, uh, PAE price is acceptable to firm uh, A and it reaches the lowest point on its uh, um, ISO uh, profit curve A1, A2. Now, if uh, the firm B reduces its price further down to P, then what will happen to price of firm A? Now, firm A cannot reduce the price further than PAE because that will mean that it will be moved to the next uh, uh, isoprofit curve uh, A1, which will mean lower profits for a firm A.
Now this unit profit maximizing uh, price is determined at the lowest point on the highest attainable ISO profit curve of way. Now here, unlike the uh, Kurno model where we said the uh, ISO profit curve should be closest to the axis, here we are talking about the highest uh, ISO profit curve and the lowest point on that particular ISO profit curve. So minimum points on the ISO profit curves right, uh, lie right to each other and when we connect these uh, um, lowest points of the ISO profit curve we get what is called as A's reaction curve. So B is changing the price and A is reacting to it and therefore we call it as A's reaction curve. So when A moves to a higher level of uh, profit, uh, because it, uh, it, it is still uh, in a condition where it is not reducing the price, it gains some customers of B. So when uh, B, if, if B goes to a higher price, then the customers will be with uh, uh, consumers of uh, firm A. So we join the lowest points of the uh, points of equilibrium and we get what is called as the ISO profit curve. As a uh, reaction curve. Now the firm reaction curve of B will be derived in a similar manner where firm A will make the necessary changes in the prices and firm A will have firm B will have to respond to those changes in prices and thus the changes should get more custom uh, if uh, uh, any change in the price then firm B should get more customers if the uh, prices are uh, lowered now, uh, then what it was earlier. Now, what is Bertrand's uh, stable equilibrium? Bertrand's stable equilibrium is attained at the point where we introduce both the reaction curves and we allow both the reaction curves to interact with each other or intersect with each other. So, at this uh, intersection point, we say that the firms have reached a stable equilibrium. But if it is above or below the stable equilibrium uh, level, then there are certain forces that will operate in such a way, the consumers, the market will operate in such a way that it will force the two firms to move back to this position of equilibrium. So by using reaction curve, we can show that the two firms will work in such a way to reach that equilibrium level where both the firms' prices are, where the prices of both the firms are equally acceptable to the two firms. So you can see in the, the diagram. Now, if firm A charges lower price PA1, so A charges a lower price PA1. So what will happen to firm B? Now firm B will come down from PB2 and come down to firm a price level PB1. Now this uh, process will continue from E downwards. If one of the firm rate changes the prices, then the other firm will uh, follow that ch uh, change in price and bring it down to near the same level. So we can find that at price uh, PA1, the price that uh, firm uh, B is charging is PB1. And if the price was at PB2 or PA2 of firm um, A, then the price of firm B was PB2. And when the price of firm A is PAE, then firm B will be at PBE, which is the position of equilibrium. Anything above that, even if the firms decide to re, um, reach a fix up a price which is higher to that, it is not sustainable because the firms, the, uh, the rival firm will push down the prices and bring them back to E. So this movement towards uh, E by both the firms will show that the firms reach their equilibrium position and this price undercutting will continue to reach that uh, equilibrium. So this process will continue until the price reach competitive levels. That is the cost uh, has to be considered and if no firms will like to uh, cut the prices to such a level that it is below the cost of production that no firm will do. So neither of the firms will raise the prices because raising the price would mean losing customers and therefore the firms will be safe in terms of the prices that they are going to charge. Thus the firms will reach equilibrium. So price war is essentially the idea that Bertrand was trying to explain that firms will cut price uh, in such a way that both of them uh, almost reach the same level of profit, otherwise this price war will continue. 
Now, if we evaluate the uh, Bertrand's model, we find that uh, the assumptions of uh, Kurnow can be criticized here and that the firms are going to be so straightforward in their action that they will only change the prices. That is not true. And then we also say that this kind of behavior will not lead to industry's profit being maximized, nor can we deal with the, uh, the uh, firms, other firms entry into this market cannot be explained by this model. It also does not incorporate ideas relating to uh, advertising cost or uh, selling costs or location of the plant or uh, product differentiation. None of these ideas can be incorporated into this model because it's very limited only to the price factor. And uh, what is the good thing about this uh, model? The good thing about this model or the utility of this model is in terms of leading uh, the idea of oligopoly to reach the various models that are built later and also to explain the game theory which came in later. Now mind you all these uh, models that have come later are based on Kurno's model. That is why in the first session I had said Kurno has given enough work in the hands of economists later to continue to develop the idea further. And in the real business world what really happens there are a lot of changes that happens in the business world just than the prices uh, for firms share information but it depends on what kind of information they share and there is also what is called as non-price competition there could be product differentiation there could be advertising and there could be other selling activities or location of the plant all of these can actually change in real life so coming back to Kuro's model uh, Bertrand's model it is to show that prices determine the profits of a firm in oligopoly when there are just few firms participating in it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends and post your valuable comments so that I could make uh, changes in the presentation uh, after this. Thank you very much.